Good morning. Good morning, Metropolitan State. There are lots of uh, great seats down front at no extra charge today, so come on in. Good morning. My name is Tom Cook, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the, 19, the 2017 uh, convocation event at Metropolitan State University. Thank you for being here. And without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our president, Ginny Arthur. Please welcome Ginny. Thank you. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for being here. Uh, I also welcome you to our 2017 convocation. It's really wonderful to see this auditorium almost full, and we are also live streaming today. We have, uh, thanks to our CIO and his team, we've developed a great live streaming capability. Uh, so I know that there may be people sitting, oh, who knows where, around the Twin Cities and other places uh, who are listening in and watching this morning. Uh, I hope you all are feeling that sense of excitement, which I think is building uh, as we approach the start of classes. I know when I left the office the other night, there was a group of five or six students uh, sitting in the Great Hall, uh, comparing their schedules and talking about uh, what the new classes were. And I just said, well, this is why uh, we do what we do. So one of the many joys of uh, this time of year is the opportunity for us to meet new colleagues who've joined our community since our last convocation. As uh, some of you, some of the early birds anyway, entered uh, the auditorium today, we did have a scrolling PowerPoint uh, with displaying the pictures of our new colleagues. So at least we thought maybe you would get a glimpse of them and know that they are someone you ought to uh, talk to in the next uh, day or so and get to, to know them. I, I want to thank Marketing and Communications because they spent, I think, the last week or so scurrying around campus uh, to capture a photo of everyone who has joined the university since last August. We actually had a few slides without photos, um, and that's mostly because they joined the university this week. Uh, and we, we weren't able to uh, track them down. Uh, but even though we've switched over the display right now, I would like to ask anyone who is new to the university uh, since August 14th of uh, 2016 to please stand. Well, thanks to everyone for that warm welcome for that. I hope that during our picnic, which is coming up uh, after this talk, and in the meet and greet for our new provost, Dr. Amy Gort, and our new dean of the College of Sciences, Kyle Swanson, which occurs at 2.30, um, that you'll try to seek out one of these new people and introduce yourself. Uh, I do want to remind everyone that 2.30, there's a little bonus, there's also ice cream. <laughs> and I'm learning, I can use the clicker, whoops, point at the booth. All right, well, when we have so many joyful things to celebrate today as we start the new year, but I also want to take just a moment to reflect on the loss to our university community that occurred last month. Doug Knowlton, our Associate Provost for Student Success, passed away unexpectedly on July 5th. For those who, of you who knew and worked with Doug, I know you remember a kind and helpful person 
who was extraordinarily supportive of our students. In fact, all those really difficult student cases that come to the provost or came to the president's office, I knew I could turn them over to Doug and that he would handle them with the greatest care and tact. One of the things uh, I really admired about Doug was the way that he treated every encounter with a student as an opportunity for the student to learn something new about how to navigate in the world and for him to learn something new. So I hope, uh, while we will miss Doug, that his spirit will help to inspire all of us to go that extra step to help our students, even, and maybe especially, the most difficult ones. Before I begin my main remarks, I want to answer some of the questions that I've heard people ask about convocation. Things like, what is it? Or why do we have one? Well, the literal meaning of the word is a large formal assembly of people. This is actually a picture of a university's convocation. Over time, the word convocation really has become associated with colleges and universities and involves a formal gathering to recognize a new class of students or the beginning of the academic year. In some universities, it's a ceremony held at the other end of a student's academic life uh, as they graduate from the university to mark the honors that they have accumulated. In either case, the convocation marks an important event in the life of an academic community. Students are usually in attendance and are usually the focus. And you get speeches about the important life transition occurring for the student and their family members from the president, the provost, faculty members. And as Steve Reed dropped his uh, child off at college yesterday, did you, you get some of those speeches there? You know what I'm talking about. And these might be the convocations you remember from your own college experience. Well, in higher ed, we like rituals. And even as a non-traditional university, we use these ritual occasions to mark important moments in the life of our university and for our students. Because our students have busy lives and many competing demands, and because they don't live on our campus, it has never been practical to call them together for a traditional convocation. Instead, we put our emphasis on coming together as a community to reconnect after a quieter summer and to reflect on our shared purpose as an academic community that provides a different experience for our non-traditional student body. So we are coming together today to mark our students' passage into higher education or their progress toward another academic year. So let's keep them in mind as we take this time to think about some of the accomplishments of our campus community and prepare ourselves for the upcoming year and look ahead to our long-term future. As is tradition, I want to recap some highlights from the year that just passed. First, whoops, our most significant, I must have a you know, trigger finger. Uh, <laughs> our most significant shared accomplishment is the conferral of almost 2,200 bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees during the 2017 <laughs> academic year. This spring marked our 100th commencement, and this year we produced the largest number of graduates ever. We are so proud of each and every one of them. After several years of hard work by a dedicated group of faculty and staff, we were pleased to have our accreditation 
reaffirmed this spring by the Higher Learning Commission. Well, we have a few things we still need to demonstrate to them. You will note that our next reaffirmation check-in comes in 10 years. Hopefully, we will all be around for it, right? We all want to be here for that next moment. Actually, I know a few people who have planned to make a graceful exit before then. <laughs> Maybe it was working on this one. <laughs> Responding to the feedback from our systems portfolio report, making improvements to our processes, and documenting all of that good work really was a Herculean task. I'm grateful to everyone who assisted. It was a team effort in a way that it never has been at Metropolitan State before. I know we've suffered a lot over the construction of the most beautiful parking ramp in Minnesota. I mean, you have to say, it really looks nice. But the bright side, it has allowed us to bring so many intellectually and culturally enriching activities to our campus in this last year. Even, ironically maybe, helping us to strengthen our bonds with the East Side neighborhood and across St. Paul. I'm only sharing a few such events here, but really, over the past year, we have introduced a few thousand people to Metropolitan State who didn't even know we existed. I've heard so many compliments about the beauty of our campus and the importance of the work that we do with students. Again, just a few highlights because there were too many notable events to list them all. And I'll mention a few more later in the talk. But this is the Overcoming Racism Conference, which was held on campus in November. We've been hosting it for the last few years, but this year was the largest yet, and it almost strained our physical capacity. For keynote addresses, uh, the auditorium here was filled to capacity with people standing in the back, and we had to have overflow seating and viewing in the Founders Hall reception area. Just last month, we hosted the first regional meeting of the U.S. Advisory Council on Human Trafficking. One of our alumna, Ukola Oriola, is a member of the council. The town hall was uh, attended by several elected officials, the head of the BCA, the director of the Twin Cities FBI office, the Ramsey County attorney, officials from the Department of Health, and many community members and organizations. The State Department officials who accompanied the council praised Metropolitan State for its service to traditionally underserved students and our engagement and commitment to improving our community. This spring was our second year for hosting the Minneapolis St. Paul International Film Festival. Kind of a funny story there. It was the 35th year for the renowned Minneapolis St. Paul Film Festival, but only the second year that they've shown films in St. Paul. <laughs> so they finally able to live up to their name, and that's because of the outstanding renovation of this auditorium as a state-of-the-art digital cinema and the tireless work of our screenwriting professor, James Byrne. The International Film Festival joined the Kia Dab Neng Mung Film Festival, the first and only of its kind, uh, which we have hosted since it got started. I think they too are delighted with the new facilities, and that's a picture of their audience that you see on the screen behind me. You should be watching News at Metro for announcements of interesting film screenings because we now have them quite regularly. In fact, uh, I've be, be, uh, been uh, beginning to shop 
for a commercial popcorn maker. It might be a <laughs> revenue source. Went too far. Our Grow It Center concept, and for those who have been wondering, Grow It stands for Gateway for Research, Outreach and Workforce Development, Innovation, and Teaching. You really have to struggle to get a good acronym. <laughs> but the Grow It Center, our old dilapidated greenhouse, took a step closer to becoming reality this spring when the legislature appropriated $400,000 in the agriculture bill for the renovation and upgrade of the facility. We have already gathered another $260,000 in grants from a variety of foundations. So the goal of 1.2 million for this project is in reach. What you'll notice about the greenhouse is it has an addition projected for the front, which will provide a classroom, a place for community gathering, uh, for community uh, forums and workshops. And we're excited about the range of academic programs that will be participating once it's open. Speaking of grant activity, more of our faculty and staff than ever are pursuing grants and the university has had increasing success. Many of you may know that we received a grant a couple of years ago from the Great Lakes Foundation, which uh, allowed us uh, to pay stipends to our students who were seeking internships. And internships are incredibly important, and our students were often foreclosed because of the lack of funds. They need to work for money. Um, this year, the Great Lakes uh, Foundation awarded us a multi-year grant to provide emergency funds for our students. So that $100 office visit copay that they need for their sick child, uh, the car repair, those are the kinds of things that we're going to be able uh, to fix for our students. And we know those are the things that can so easily derail their education. I'd like to note also that Metropolitan State is among the first four-year university that has been given this grant. In the past, it's gone to two-year colleges. Uh, we also, uh, you'll see, uh, we have a suicide prevention grant from SAMHSA. We've got grants from the Department of Education. The Travelers Foundation has renewed its support for our program there. The Graves Foundation provided funding to support uh, teachers uh, of color, uh, teacher candidates of color. So it's been great opportunities. We still have several grant applications that are outstanding. Uh, things are moving a little slowly in Washington, D.C. these days. Uh, but we're hopeful that uh, many of those will be funded. So the CFO, the provost, and I recognize that we need to develop better support for your work in this area. So we're planning to hire a staff member in the provost's office to provide post-grant support for faculty and staff, probably the worst part of grants <laughs> management. I see Katija was the first to applaud that, and of course she does the overall accounting and reporting for grants, um, so getting good work done at that grant-based level will be good for her too. Uh, we also, I also uh, have engaged a consultant who we've worked with in the past on grant making, uh, Fox Advancement, some of you may know them, and they'll be coming to campus in the next few weeks uh, to sit down and talk with interested faculty and staff, review our programs, and then provide us with a strategic plan for the pursuit of grants. 
So they're going to identify where we are most likely to be successful so that we can put our efforts into the right places. And we know that grants are an important supplemental funding source that allow us to take on uh, important service to students, such as the emergency grants, to support curriculum development and uh, scholarly activity. I want to thank everyone who submitted a grant this year, whether it was successful or not, because by putting together the grant, you're building our experience and our capacity for the future. FY17 was also a notable year for university fundraising. This is a picture of the Carter family. And Jason Carter, who's sitting at the front of the photo, is a former student of ours in the natural sciences who di died a year ago in May. After coming to campus, meeting faculty and students, and learning about the significant work of this university in educating traditionally underserved students, Bob and Diana Carter pledged $2 million to support science students and faculty to honor Jason, who struggled valiantly with cancer. Pledging over a five-year term, the Carters have already given us more than 60% of the promised gift so that we could begin supporting students as quickly as possible. The first Carter Scholars were named this spring. On September 9th, we will officially name the Science Education Center in honor of Jason Carter. And I hope some of you will be there. So those are the big highlights of the past year. I really could go on uh, telling you about all the marvelous work at the university, but that will give you the high points. But now I want to turn our focus to the future. Earlier this summer, I was invited to give an opening address at the national meeting of an organization called the Network for Change in Continuous Improvement in Higher Education. They also need some consulting on their work, on their name, but known as NCCI. As I discovered, uh, this is a group of pretty prestigious, mostly public universities from the US and Canada, who are all grappling with how to maintain educational excellence in the face of a turbulent higher education environment and declining public trust. The theme for their meeting was honoring tradition, shaping the future. So as I was in conversation with the conference organizer and the president about my address, I said, well, this is easy for me to fit my remarks to your theme. Because Metropolitan State is really an exemplar of a university grappling with reconciling these two ideas, tradition and the future. In fact, the talk went so well, I asked him if I could appropriate their theme, and they agreed I'd made a perfect case. In some ways, it's paradoxical for a non-traditional university to talk about its traditions. But I find that the founding principles of this university are exactly what position us for an exciting and meaningful future. I aim to make my case to you and to the wider community of funders, employers, alumni, and other potential supporters, that it is those traditional principles that make this university absolutely critical to maintaining the well-being of this region and the state of Minnesota. If we embrace and fully honor these traditions, we are prepared to meet and master the future, advantaging our graduates and enriching our communities. So what is our heritage and what are our traditions? 
I'm quoting the founders here, Chancellor Ted Mitow and President David Sweet, who by their pictures may not look like non-traditionalists, but they were. Um, and here's what they said. Metropolitan states should be innovative and non-traditional. Metropolitan state should be a college with the community as its campus. And metropolitan state should serve non-traditional learners and meet the unmet educational needs of the Twin Cities. As David Sweet liked to say, we are a college for those who have no college. These founding principles and core values are exactly what our society is seeking and that our state needs in the 21st century. So why am I so convinced of this? Well, if we've learned anything about the accelerating pace of change in our society, it's that we can't predict how the future will look. But we can observe the direction of change, and we can do our best to ride the crest, even amid all that turbulence. And I, even though our provost did just come back from Hawaii, that's not her. <laughs> Although I know she is prepared to ride the turbulence. In Minnesota, we have an excellent state demographer, and she and her staff have done a great deal of work analyzing a variety of data and giving us a clear picture of the not-so-distant future in Minnesota. Three related trends stand out. Minnesotans are aging. I know, it comes as a surprise. <laughs> you look around this room, how can it be? But over the next 17 and a half years, uh, the under age 18 population will grow modestly. The prediction is about 32,000 more people under age 18. While those over the age of 65 will increase by a half million. By 2035, there will be more people over age 65 living in the state of Minnesota than there will be people under the age of 18 the first time ever. In 1970, just for comparison, just before we were founded, people under the age of 18 outnumbered older Minnesotans by a factor of three and a half to one. So if you've paid any attention to the health and human services discussions that go on nationally or in our state, you know this is not good. From the standpoint of higher education funding, which I will get to in a minute, this is very bad. Second trend, shifts in our labor force. Well, not surprising, with aging, a lot of people think about retirement. And as early as next year, the number of jobs in the state may exceed the number of working age people. We live in a prosperous state, one with relatively good government, nice parks and amenities, and lots of cultural opportunities. We love it here. But this has everything to do with a vibrant business and nonprofit community. And they will go elsewhere if they can't find qualified workers here. Third trend, and one we know very well, the growing racial and ethnic diversity of our state. We see it every day in our students and in our employees. Now I want to note that this is not a St. Paul or Minneapolis classroom. This is a suburban elementary school classroom. This is a trend that is affecting our state very uh, widely. And here's the real issue in that for our state. While 37% of white Minnesotans, that group of people who's going to retire, have a bachelor's degree. But the rate of bachelor degree holding for Ojibwe and Dakota in the state is eight or 9%. 
For Somalis, it's about 11%. For Mexicans, the largest group of Latinos in our state, 12%. African Americans, 17%. And for the Hmong community, about 21%. I think you can see, putting these issues together, where the problem lies. I don't see any other higher education institution in the state whose mission is so clearly aligned to closing this critical higher education gap, or any institution that is more capable of serving a diverse Minnesota than Metropolitan State University. Well, what else? Well, thank you. <laughs> What else do we know about the future? Well, we can surmise from this chart that as a public institution, we're going to have to find a way to fulfill our mission with a lower level of state support. We, we're never going back. We, are, we have closed the gap a little in the last couple of years, but we are never going back to the 70% from the state and the 30% from the student. That, those days are gone, and we can see that with some other trends, it may be a problem of a widening gap again. The big dilemma, especially for a university like Metropolitan State, or even for our whole system, our students are likely going to be coming from more economically deprived circumstances. Uh, they aren't going to be able to make up the tuition gap either. Our interim chancellor was on campus a couple of weeks ago, and uh, I think he put it well when he said, we live in an environment where it takes a dollar to educate the student. We get 40 cents from the state, and the state tells us we can charge the student 45 cents. It doesn't add up. So we're going to have to do some thinking about how we can do this. Uh, creativity will be necessary. Well, we can't discuss the future without talking a little bit about technology. Anybody remember that green screen flip phone, one of the earliest smartphones? We thought it was so cool. Okay, now we have our little computers that we carry with us everywhere. And of course, uh, there is a quiz who can name all 16 of those social media symbols. And how many do you use? In higher education, these big changes in technology affect us both in how we deliver education and how we interact with students and each other, but it may be changing our students and their approach to education as well. As I say, early smartphones have been around since the early 1990s but were first owned by more than 50% of the U.S. population in 2000. The author of an upcoming feature story in the Atlantic magazine titled How Smartphones Have Ruined a Generation traces some disturbing trends to that point in history, the point when children began to have smartphones. Tech is permeating our daily life. Predictions are that by 2020, there will be 50 billion, 50 billion devices connected to the internet. The population estimate for 2020 is about 7.7 .7 billion. So even, you know, any of us can easily do that math, somewhere around seven devices for every person on the planet, no matter where they live. No wonder that some are saying digital awareness is the new liberal art. It's interesting that in the past 20 years, 
more than 500 new types of jobs have been created. And this has been a faster rate of new job creation than we've ever seen before. As a species, we're pretty bad at predicting what those future jobs will be. Uh, and you'll see one I'm going to show you in a minute uh, that who would have ever thought this would be. So people really are going to need to be lifelong learners. We've always talked about that in higher education, but now everybody else agrees with us that it's true. They will be coming in and out of higher education to refresh their knowledge and skills over the course of their lifetime. So in some ways, that's a very positive trend for us, um, although it's going to be then important for us to realize we have to maintain those connections. And we're going to have to simplify the on and off ramps to education. OK, I'm sorry if the pictures are cheesy, but you know, I'm not a. <laughs> By the way, part of that whole change, competency-based education. Now, competency-based education is a part of our heritage and tradition. In fact, we were among the first to consciously design and give credit for experiential learning and to certify prior learning that students came to us with for academic credit. However, combined with trends in technology and neuroscience, competency-based education is taking on an entirely different twist than what we're used to. Employers are starting to look for micro-credentials, or what we call badges. Okay? Anybody who's a Girl Scout or a Boy Scout, you know you got a badge when you could start the fire without a match. OK, the, these badges are telling employers that an individual has been judged and certified by an educator as mastering a particular skill or body of knowledge. Self-paced and individualized learning is becoming increasingly desirable to those young people who've spent their life on a smartphone. And as we move from the industrial mass production model of education to a more personal approach. In that evolving model of education, faculty use their disciplinary and pedagogical knowledge in a different way. And we have colleagues here at the university who might be able to help us think about how that ought to be done. My picture here is of a smartphone, which carries a student's uh, badge transcript. They can pull out their, uh, their smartphone. This is using blockchain technology. Are you proud of me, IT people? I know about blockchain technology. I can't explain it in detail now, because we just don't have time. <laughs> But on that, they will be able to carry a certified transcript, not an unofficial transcript, a certified transcript. So interestingly, here's what employers have told Jeff Salingo, who's a higher education analyst and writer, that they want to see in their employees, starting right now. People looking for jobs ought to be curious, ask questions, and be self-directed learners for life. They should take risks and learn the meaning of grit, meaning they ought to learn from failure and take setbacks in stride. Again, they better have that digital awareness, and they need to learn to deal with ambiguity. Excelling at any job is about doing the things you weren't asked to do, or so says the senior vice president for strategy and corporate development at Starbucks. And they need to have a personal growth mindset. And finally, be humble and learn from peers and mentors. I think we already do a good job. I think those, our students do come out with those characteristics. But that tells us we need all parts of the university working together to develop these kind of skills. Our traditional liberal arts core, that certainly is a critical part 
of um, what we want to help our students develop. It's not just the technical skills. When I had the opportunity to speak at that NCCI conference this summer, I got to meet this guy, Jamie Kasep. And uh, I have to say, he has one of my favorite new job titles. He's Google's chief education evangelist. I've decided I'm Metropolitan State's chief education evangelist. He talked a lot about what motivates people today, and really probably forever, um, if we think about it. Uh, and he said, you ought to read Daniel Pink's book, Drive. So I did. And basically, what we know is what really motivates people is that internal drive to solve problems. So Google's chief education evangelist says, don't ask students what they want to major in. Ask them what problems they want to solve. And then help them assemble the knowledge and the skills that they need to be able to do that. And you'll find that people will be very motivated to, uh, to complete their degree and to remain engaged with the university. One of the major issues that's driving uh, opinions in the public about higher education today and its value is the issue of degree completion. Unless we are talking about one of the very elite, incredibly expensive universities, quarter of a million dollars for an education, the rate of student success in our country is pretty dismal. Um, there's nothing worse in my mind than a student who borrows thousands of dollars and then leaves university without a degree. They never have a chance to really make those payments and to get ahead, and especially in a world where right now the return to a bachelor's degree over your lifetime is estimated at more than one million dollars. We talk a lot about the 1% and the 99%. There's huge inequality among the 99%, and the division is bachelor's degree or not. So we, we have a vested interest in helping to solve that problem. Here's the data you see on the screen is Metropolitan State's data about graduation rates. And really, for a public university, 60% or so isn't terrible. Of course, we'll notice some interesting patterns. You do a lot better if you enter in the fall rather than the spring. And you do a lot better if you study full-time rather than part-time. So we know that's not going to be possible for all of our students. So the problem I want to solve is, how do we make it possible for those part-time students to be able to complete at a higher rate? We do good work, but this isn't good enough. We've got to do more to, for our students. This is a, another set of figures that looks at the problem from a, a different point of view, uh, and that is how we retain students. You'll notice over the past several years, we've barely moved the needle. And we've tried a lot of different things, but so we've got to get more focused and figure out what will work for our students. And again, this same pattern holds. If you can go full time, then you are, and you start in the fall, must be that traditional sense of uh, higher education, uh, you, you do much better in staying in school than if you start in the spring and you go part time. So what does this all mean for Metropolitan State and its future? We're back to the crystal ball, but I'm going to give it a try. First of all, I think we are critical to the prosperity of the Twin Cities and the state. We have the learning environment and the expertise 
to serve those who need and want to be university educated over the next few decades. Our focus on community engagement is integral to our own future, to the health of our region, and to the educational experience of our students. It certainly aligns with our identity as an urban university. Those cities in front of us provide the rich learning environments that promote the desired outcomes for students that I just enumerated employers are looking for. Solving problems in and with the communities we are situated in improves the future for everyone. This is uh, the esteemed Professor Hoffman, uh, engaged in active learning about how you build communities, how you empower people uh, through the activity of gardening. And it takes getting out there, right, and digging in the soil and harvesting to make this happen. Uh, we, and in the, our engagement to the community, teachers, uh, this is one of our other great events that we just held, but I think it's also illustrative of how we work together with the community. Uh, again, we had well over 300 people, I think, who attended the Teachers of Color and American Indian Teachers uh, get together last week here on campus. A group of people who are coming together to solve an important problem for our state. A year and a half ago, there were 40 people. Now, over 300, and not everybody who would like to be involved was able to come. Uh, many of you on campus are familiar on our work through the Forum on Understanding and Responding to Mass Incarceration. In typical Metropolitan State University fashion, we bring faculty, students, staff, community members, uh, you know, the people who have been affected by mass incarceration together. And we sit down and we say, what can we learn to solve our problem? Okay. Declining public financial support, increasing costs, growing support needs of our students, and entrenched ways of operating create a wicked problem for all higher education institutions, including Metropolitan State. And wicked problem is a term originally uh, developed by engineers, but really now appropriated to describe the complex issues that we face as a society. Wicked problems are characterized by competing values and paradoxes. If you do this, you may not be able to do that. Importantly, there are no technical solutions. You can't do research to solve them. They can't be divided up into manageable parts. We sometimes think about that as a way to solve a problem. And most importantly, we have to realize that wicked problems like the issues we face in higher education, can't be solved. They can only be managed over time. So what are the wicked problems we have here at Metropolitan State? And I know for some of you, it's not me. Okay. Uh, there are other things. <laughs> um, one is understanding that changing nature of our students, because the research is all muddied up, and we know that people have necessarily always done research on our student population, so we have to find our way alone. Um, tapping into that heritage of educational innovation. It's a tradition to not make a lot of change in higher ed, and yet we need to. Uh, assuring that our students succeed. It's a complicated issue, and how do we sort it out? Managing those competing demands for quality, affordability, and cost containment. Developing an academic plan that aligns with our engaged urban mission. And moving our partnership strategy to greater maturity. These are all characteristic 
wicked problems. So how are we going to manage them? Well, the only way to manage a wicked problem is through ongoing collaboration from those who are most affected by the problem. So that means you, me, our students, our community members, legislators. We need that process, constant communication, and negotiation focused on these are the most important common problems. How do we manage them? And more than ever before, we can't go it alone. We need partners. That whole collaboration has to stretch outside the boundaries of the university. And those may be community colleges. Uh, they may be employers like Hennepin and Ramsey counties. They may be associations like the Central Corridor Anchor Partnership where a variety of educational institutions and, in this case, hospitals uh, come together, the EDS and MEDS, to try to solve the problems of poverty in our city and um, the issues of that declining uh, uh, pool of employees. So I'll move to our mission and vision. Let me sum up by saying it's clear. We've got challenges ahead of us. But I believe that unlike other universities who are locked into a traditional model of education that won't fare well in the future by their heritage and traditions, our heritage, our core principles enable us, maybe even compel us, to take risks and step in to the role of an education leader, which knows how to manage those wicked problems well. The welfare of our students, their families, and the state we call home requires us to be bold and courageous in confronting and managing them. I believe we are a community, a campus community, that is energized by large and worthy tasks, and we'll stop at nothing to give our students the transformative experiences they deserve and the possibility of ennobling futures. I look forward with the greatest enthusiasm to our work together. Thank you. Now, I have to tell you, I'm going to be in a lot of trouble if you leave the auditorium before 11.15, because Shelly is so worried about getting the lunch picnic set up correctly for you and for us not to have problems. So um, since we have a few minutes, we have some mics. If anyone would like to offer a comment or ask a question, um, I would be glad for us to begin engaging in the dialogue. So anybody have anything they'd like to ask about or say? Such a shy group. I sing? Please. <laughs> Hello. Um, I'd like to recognize August Hoffman if he's here. I don't know, is he here? He's here. <laughs> Thank you, August, um, for your tremendous work in the greenhouse. I know we saw your picture, but when they showed it, um, you were really the effort. So just want to let you know I appreciate that. Given that we have the opportunity for time, perhaps you could say a few words about Charlottesville? Well, this is a dark time, I think, in many ways for our country. 
and it's very disturbing to see the images. When I saw that being played, you know, over the weekend and last night, of course, in the wake of our president's, our U.S. president's uh, comments on the situation, uh, you know, that image of people with torches running through the dark, marching through the dark, it, it just conjures up a very, very uncomfortable and a disturbing image. Uh, as a university, uh, we, we are committed to the free exchange of ideas, but we will not tolerate uh, hateful behavior that is hurtful. We know we serve a very vulnerable population of students. They are feeling so threatened, many of them, uh, in the current circumstances, and we have people among our employees as well who feel that sense of vulnerability. So we, we need to come together uh, in the most positive way that we can as a community, uh, and we, I, I'm counting on everyone on campus to help us think of things that we can do uh, to be a positive force in the community, to stand for you know, what we believe are uh, the values. Uh, you know, if I think they are American. I think they're probably universal values, which are of justice and equity and um, opportunity for people. And uh, you know, free speech is a concept which is really being tested right now. And uh, I notice I have a son who is a student at the University of Florida. And Richard Spencer uh, was planning or is trying to uh, appear on the University of Florida campus. He was also uh, attempting to appear at Texas A&M. And I think it's a strategy because as public universities, we are held to we're an arm of the government, and so we are supposed to give free, free reign to these values, but we have to be the ones to help define when the line in the sand has to be drawn and not allow hateful speech. <clears throat> I did see that Texas A&M did say they will not allow the speech on campus. <clears throat> I haven't heard about other opportunity, excuse me, other, other arenas that they might be challenging. Uh, we're probably not the university that's in those crosshairs because there's another really big public university across the uh, town here. But still, um, I, we, we will be vigilant in this regard. Um, thank, thank you, Jenny. Um, I'd like to go back to peaceful local topics, if I might. And I do think the Growit Center is such a great example of uh, faculty and, and administrators working together on a common purpose. And, you know, we've acknowledged August's contribution to that, but I want to also acknowledge Mark Asplin of the Science Department and his enormous time and effort that he has spent on that. And, of course, uh, Tom Nelson was really visionary in leading that project forward. But its success really has also depended on this group of faculty and administrators working with our local community partners, people from the neighborhood who share a common interest. And I think uh, even though it's not fully funded yet, um, and it's just a small building, it's still a great example of what can be accomplished when people work with each other, even when there's perhaps diversity of uh, goals and objectives and so on. So, yeah, thank, thank you, you for Virginia. highlighting yeah. that. Oh, we have. As long as we're talking about the Growth Center, I'd also like to, there's actually been a, a large team of faculty and staff working on this project, but I would like to recognize Jody Bantley, 
who's been taking a big lead in working with advancement mm -hmm. and submitting the proposals and grants, and also Patsy Noble from Urban Roots, who's been a very strong community uh, partner. So there have been a lot of people, faculty and staff involved, and thank you to all of them because we're just about there. Anyway, but I don't want to leave anyone out, but those two particularly. And I want to say I don't want to leave anyone out either. And the Grow It Center, the progress we've made, it is a wonderful example of how uh, groups with different interests and ideas can come together and collaborate and make something happen. It's one example. Across this campus, I could give you the honor roll of people who are doing all of that kind of work every day to make other things happen here at the university. So thank you to everyone. You're going to get me in trouble with Shelly. <laughs> you will? You promise to walk slow? Don't ask for any food before 11.15. Um, uh, hi, Jenny. Thanks for giving me the microphone again. Great, great first name, by the way. Um, <laughs> university need, needs more Jennies. Yeah. Um, you know, you had a lot of good words there, and, you know, I liked all that. Uh, but, you know, I like specifics, too. So, crystal ball, what, what do you think? concrete, specific highlights of this academic year. If you could predict three things that you're going to be bragging about this time next year, what would you predict? Uh, okay, uh, I can only have three. That's, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to say one thing which I know is not... Um, and they like to say sexy, I guess, uh, you know, that uh, seems as great as the Grow It Center, but is extremely important to building uh, our, our future. And that is, we spent a lot of time last spring talking about how we will have a more effective and efficient system of coming together in committees and work groups and task forces to accomplish projects like the Grow It Center. And uh, so we're going to be ready to kick off a, a new set of university councils. Uh, we have full representation on those. Um, in fact, even some groups that have not always been included uh, in the past uh, very specifically and so uh, I'm proud of the fact that we make sure every group of employees has a voice here as well as our students uh, and I think that um, I'm going to be able to say we accomplished a whole long list of things because we will bring more focus to the work uh, we will be able to promote that better communication and more collaboration and uh, and, and that's it. Those wicked problems are going to require that kind of thing. So, you know, I, I want to be able to say that instead of 78 and growing a uh, number of committees, task forces, work groups, and so on, that we have 20. And uh, that they are, everyone's pleased with their work and, and uh, we're, we're moving ahead efficiently. Uh, you know, certainly I will also say that um, I think in that regard, uh, having conversations and having a clear sense of where we want to move academically, how we will reach out to uh, communities to attract more students so that they can uh, take an advantage of our educational offerings will be uh, one of the tops on my list. Uh, and I don't know, let's see, getting a $5 million step-up grant, how's that, uh, to uh, uh, support student work and, and to build our programs in the sciences. So there, there that's three, um, you know, I'll have more as, as the year goes on.
as we're looking at a lot of this, I think what you emphasized that is particularly important is not the content or the goal, but the processes that we use to get there. The means determine the ends. But I think one of the issues we need to confront as a university is we talk a lot about collaboration and cooperation, and those are well and good. But I also think we as a university sometimes either focus too much on conflict or run and hide in fear of conflict. A healthy organization has conflict. But the distinction that needs to be kept in mind by everyone in this university is a distinction about conflict. Destructive conflict tears an institution apart. But constructive conflict is what moves us forward. And we cannot move forward without constructive conflict. So if, if there's one thing I ask members of this community to do this year, is do not run and hide from conflict, but do not be a force of destructive conflict. Figure out how, when we come to a point of conflict, that we do so in a constructive way. Uh, it's brief and simple, but Watching this university over the past 33 years, when we slide into destructive conflict, it tears the roots out of this institution. But when we manage to carry out constructive conflict, we bond people and we move forward into the future. That's all. Well said, Monty. Thank you very much. And um, unless anyone has a burning comment, by the time you get over there, you, know, you saw these people leaving. They're the servers of the food, so, uh, so we're good. But thank you all for being here, and I, I look forward to our work together. Thanks. <laughs>